Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samir Pai. I am a first year at MIT and an organizer for HMT Education. Uh, we're so excited that you're joining us today for this class with Gaurav Gol about algebraic geometry. Uh, I'd like to begin by sharing a couple logistical ground rules. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask any questions, and you can upvote any other questions that you find interesting. Uh, however, I'd like to remind you that Gaurav is taking time out of their own day to join us, which we're very grateful for. Uh, so please remember to be on your best behavior and respect the teacher, this classroom, and your peers. We can and will remove you if you're being disruptive, either in the chat or the Q&A. So please don't abuse this privilege. Um, now I'll introduce Gaurav before passing it off to them. Uh, Gaurav is an undergraduate at Harvard studying mathematics and music. He comes from Mumbai and his current interests include algebraic and differential topology and algebraic geometry. Um, with that, thank you again for joining us, Gaurav. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Samir. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm Gaurav Goel. And as Samir said, I'm a student at Harvard and I study math and music. And today I plan to talk about algebraic geometry and why we care about algebraic geometry. So let me start sharing my screen. As Samir said, if you have any questions, pop them in the Q&A and I will try to answer them as best as I can. Uh, either during the talk, if I see them then, or right after. I'm going. I plan to leave five-ish minutes at the end, talking, answering your questions. So with that said, let me get started. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is what is algebraic geometry and why do we care about it? Well, we've all heard that algebraic geometry is a pretty big field nowadays, right? And it is, and for good reason. So let me try to tell you why that's the case. So first of all, a simple answer to this question. Algebraic geometry is a combination of the techniques of algebra, both high school algebra and abstract algebra, uh, along with the language and problems of geometry, right? And it's basically solutions to polynomials and it talks about all things of such sort. It studies zero sets of polynomials. So before I get into the specifics of algebraic geometry, let's go back a little bit and talk about just plain old geometry. <laughs> no pun intended. So yeah, geometry is one of the oldest branches of mathematics. The only other branches rivaling it being mathematical logic and number theory. Plenty of people, uh, Babylonians and Egyptians and people from the Indus Valley civilization, plenty of people studied uh, geometry. But the ancient Greeks, in particular, made tremendous progress towards making geometry and other mathematics rigorous. Euclid here of Alexandria lived around 300 BC. He's called the father of geometry. That's a pretty big title. And that's for his elements, which uh, was the textbook of geometry for over two millennia, right up till the beginning of the 19th and 20th century. But that's just one of the many fantastic Greek mathematicians there. Uh, you've got Pappus of Alexandria, you've got Thales, you've got Pythagoras of, Simos, of Samos, you've got Archimedes, Pluto, uh, Apollonius, and Diophanes, and just too many to name in one short talk. So let me give you some examples of Greek geometry at work. The first one is just conic sections. The Greek the Greeks worked with and defined conic sections as the sections of the surface of a double cone as cut out by a plane. So if you just cut it perpendicular to the axis of the cone, you're going to get a circle. If you tilt the plane a little bit, that gives you an ellipse. If you tilt the plane enough to make it parallel to the slope of the cone, that's going to give you a parabola. If you tilt it more, that's going to give you hyperbola. It's going to intersect the cone in two parts. And if the plane passes through the center of the double cone, then that's going to give you a pair of straight lines. And it's really important to keep in mind that a pair of straight lines is also a conic section. You've got other examples. You've got the Apollonius circle, um, and you've got the cissoid of Diocles. Um, the cissoid of Diocles, I've included 
to counter the common belief that the Greeks only worked with uh, what we know today to be linear and quadratic curves. That's certainly not true. The Cissoid of Diocles is an example of a curve. Uh, that's that's not a conic and the way it's defined is you take a circle and you take two parallel tangents and you trace the point m out such that om is the same as this distance m1 m2 that's the definition of yeah that's my friend <laughs> that's the definition of the cissoid of diocles uh, it can be shown <coughs> And you can probably try this on your own that the cissoid of Diocles is just the same thing as the inversion of a parabola about a, cent a circle centered at the vertex of the parabola. So try showing that. It's an interesting exercise. And then another example you've got is uh, Pappus's theorem, which says that if you've got two lines and six points on this on, on uh, the lines like this. And you intersect these in this fashion, which is, I mean, it's it's easy to see what this fashion is. I'm not going to spell it out. That that then that gives you a straight line. That's the but uh, that's Pappus's theorem. It's a non-trivial theorem. It's not obvious at all. And we're going to spend part of this talk proving Pappus's theorem. Okay. But the Greeks were not the only people who had math mathematical tricks up their sleeve. Um, Another important advancement in mathematics was made in the Islamic world during the next millennia or so. Um, so Arabic scholars and Persian scholars uh, made super important advances in all fields of mathematics. But all, you've got Al-Khwarizmi, after whom algorithm is named, and you've got a bunch of other mathematicians. Uh, one of them in particular I'm going to talk about is one who worked hard to actually realize that there is this connection between algebra and geometry. That's Omar Khayyam. So Persian mathematician uh, worked, lived around 1080, and he made significant progress in trying to understand that there is a connection between the two fields, the totally completely different fields that were known then as algebra and geometry. Well, I mean, it was not known then as algebra, but just solving polynomial equations and geometrical things, right? Uh, he also made significant progress in understanding Euclid's fifth or parallel axiom, which has got his own complicated history that I don't have the time to talk about here. But <coughs> so Omar Khayyam also, by the way, was a fantastic poet and a philosopher, and he is the composer of the Rubaiyat which is a lovely, lovely poem, and you should you should definitely check it out. Okay, so what advance did he make? Well, he was one of the first to solve a cubic equation by by using conics. So he that was his area of expertise, solving higher degree equations, particularly cubics, by intersecting conics. And the particular equation that he solved was, I, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, it's a little bit tiny here, but he's found a solution to x cubed minus 20x squared plus 200x minus 2000 by just saying that the solution of this just corresponds to a point of intersection of a circular and a rectangular hyperbola. Well, that's how we understand uh, the, what he did today, but that's not not quite the words he phrased these things in. But nonetheless, he made significant progress in this direction. But the, the real, real understanding of the connection between algebra and geometry did not come until the beginning of the 17th century. And that, the guy who is responsible for that is Rene Descartes, uh, early 17th century French philosopher and mathematician and scientist. He is most famous for his statement, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, or je pense d'où je suis. Um, and he was one of the first guys to realize that, in fact, there's a deep and profound connection between geometrical problems and algebraic ones. In his 1637, La Geometry, he introduced the notion of what are now called, in his honor, Cartesian coordinates. And all of you, I, I think, are familiar with what coordinates are. You, <clears throat> it's just the idea that you need two independent parameters, two independent coordinates, to describe the location of a point on a plane. And by studying how these parameters vary, you can talk about shapes. Well, and this 
was a huge, huge deal. It revolutionized the way we think about geometry. It completely changed the perspective we had about geometry because it reduced in an algorithmic way any geometrical problem to an algebraic one. And that was a huge, huge achievement. And it's, it's, it's got consequences that reflect across the next few centuries. And in, in particular, this was the birthplace of algebraic geometry. Well, to be fair to a few other mathematicians, <coughs> Pierre de Fermat and Oresme, both French mathematicians, also came up with the notion of coordinates independently. But, uh, and they're also sometimes credited with this work, but just sometimes we just, we just forget them. We just use the term Cartesian coordinates and that's okay. You've got a bunch of things named after people in math. Uh, there's this uh, famous quote that uh, if, if you got any topic, you name it after the second person who discovered it and not the first, because the first is always going to be Euler. And that just says how uh, vast Euler's work was, but I digress. So Rene Descartes was the guy who just changed the world of algebra and geometry. Why do you think uh, are the people who make problems for the math Olympiad so afraid of you using coordinates to solve it? Why do they create, concoct their problems in such a way that makes it really, really tedious to solve them using coordinates by hand? Well, the answer to that question is simple. The reason they do that, they do that is because they know that coordinates give you an algorithmic way of answering any geometry problem, whether it be proving tangency, whether it be proving collinearity, <coughs> coordinates give you an algorithmic way to solve that problem. That's why they're so scared, scared of these, uh, because they want you to, guys to use pure, quote unquote, pure and not algebraic geometry to solve these uh, problems. Okay. So let me give you an example of some planar curves. So now that you've got coordinates, we can look at how these coordinates vary, right? And the first example of something that tells you how coordinate varies is a, is a plane curve. It's a simple equation in two variables, say X and Y, that dictates what possible points of the plane you're selecting, right? That's the idea of a plane curve. And all of you are familiar with a linear plane curve being the same thing as a line in the plane. And that's something that just so ingrained into us with the school system that it's hard to uh, it's hard to understand. It's hard to acknowledge that to relate these two things, to relate a linear equation and a line took a lot of math. It took a lot of brain. It took a lot of ingenuity on the part of Descartes and Fermat and so on when they came up with these coordinates. So that's a line. You're also familiar with curves of degree two. They're they're known as they're basically the conics that the Greeks talked about. <clears throat> but also nothing's restricting you or stopping you from going to high degrees, right? You, still, you can look at cubics. I've given an example of a cubic curve here. I'm not sure if you can see the equation, but this cubic has got two connected components. And then I give some other fun examples that I constructed using Desmos. Here, uh, here's an example of a rose with three petals and a rose with four petals. And as an interesting exercise to you, I leave uh, the question of constructing the equation, polar or Cartesian, of a rose with n petals with a given orientation. So fun exercise, try it out if you haven't seen this before. Um, but you've also got a bunch of other curves. So for example, here I've got this curve, <coughs> excuse me, y squared equals x cubed plus x squared. And that's a fun curve because it's what is called a nodal curve. It's got a node or a nodal singularity at the origin, at the point zero comma zero. So, uh, and the, the great part about algebraic geometry, as we'll see in the next few minutes, is that this is reflected in the algebra of the, situ algebra of the situation. The next thing we have here is the curve y, cubed equal, y squared equals x cubed. And that's what's called a cuspidal curve. It's got a, it's got a cusp on, uh, at the origin. It does not self-intersect, quote unquote, but it's got this double tangency at the origin. So it's not quite smooth over, but it's smooth everywhere else. And uh, these are interesting examples of curves. Okay, so now that we've seen some curves, what's one of the first questions you ask? Well, you just see curves and then you see <coughs> that when you've got two curves on the plane, they intersect. And the great thing about Descartes coordinates 
were that they reduced the geometric problem of intersections of, cur of curves, like the intersection of a circle with a line or the intersection of a cubic with a line or with a cubic with a sphere, they reduce these geometrical problems to solving simultaneous equations, right? Which is a completely algebraic problem. So the first, one of the first and the most natural questions that you can ask is that if I've got two plane curves, well, how many points do they intersect in? But this question is not quite well framed because as you can probably imagine and see from the drawings that I've put here, that the answer, of course, depends on a lot, lot of things, right? One thing that we immediately see that this depends on is the degrees of the two curves we take into consideration. So let's ask this question. In how many points do two plane curves of degrees D and E intersect? And that's a fair question. Uh, <coughs> another way to motivate this question is to think about uh, just polynomials in one variable and their roots. So you think about some cubic curve, some cubic polynomial, so x cubed plus x squared minus x plus five, and you wanna see, well, what values of x can I plug in so that this gives me zero? And that's an interesting question. That's a very real life practical question that shows up all the time and you want answers to such questions. Well, in hindsight, we know that solving such a thing is the same as intersecting the two curves, y equals that polynomial and y equals zero. And y equals zero is a polynomial of degree one. So, and I'm not de defining degrees quite precisely here, but I'll take it on faith, I'll take it on intuition that you have an, a basic idea of what it means for a polynomial to have a certain degree, right? Just if, you, if it's got an x squared term, that's degree two. If it's got a, an x cubed term, then it's a degree three and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's, the, this is a fair question. And if, you, so let's, let's, so whenever you get a question, the, the correct way to approach solving it is to see what are the small, simple cases that I know the answer to this question in. <laughs> so instead of solving this problem for general D and E, let's just restrict our attention to small values of D and E. Well, what happens if you take D equals E equals one, right? That's the smallest value you can have and have a real question. And then the question reduces to in how many points do two curves of degree one intersect? We know a curve of degree one is just a straight line. So the question is, in how many points do two lines intersect? And the answer to that is obviously one, right? Eh, not quite. You still have to deal with issues like parallel lines and so on, uh, but it's mostly one, right? So you expect that the answer to be one or zero. So you can ask for an upper bound. But let's ask this question again in a little bit, uh, with, in a little higher degree. So let's take D equals one and E equals two. That's the next smallest special case. <coughs> and then the question is asking, in how many points does a line intersect a conic? And of course, you know again that the general answer that you expect is two, right? You think of a circle and you think of a line, the, the line obviously cuts the circle in two points. You think of a hyperbola, and you think of a line and the line, if you've got an oblique line, it cuts the hyperbola in two points. But again, you start to see problems with such an argument, right? So we might make a naive guess that, and you can do the same thing for other small values of D and E. And the naive guess that you arrive at is a very reasonable guess. It's that these curves of degrees D and E, they intersect in the product of their degrees, right? And that's a reasonable guess. For example, uh, that it says, for example, that if you take any polynomial in a single variable, so something like x cubed plus five x minus three, uh, the number of times that intersects, <coughs> the, uh, y equals that intersects y equals zero, which is a polynomial of degree one, should be the, the degree of the polynomial, right? Three, which is the statement of the fundamental theorem of algebra, right? Which says that a polynomial with um, n of degree n in a single variable uh, has n roots, which is a non-trivial statement, as you know. So this is a naive answer, and this answer is obviously not correct, because as I've demonstrated, you've got the issue of parallel lines, you've got the issue of curves not intersecting at all. So let's see what are these problems. Well, one of these problems is when you've got something like x squared minus y squared is zero, and x minus y is zero. Well, if you observe carefully, x squared minus y squared <laughs> factors as the product of x minus y and x plus y. So when x squared minus y squared is zero, 
you you got that you either land the first line which is x plus y equals zero or you land the second line which is x minus y equals zero so x squared minus y squared is zero is the union of two perpendicular lines and if you just take the other curve to be x minus y equals zero uh well now these curves intersect in a line so that's infinitely many points which is definitely not two times one equals two so what goes wrong well the thing is that the curves you've taken are not nice because one of them contains the other right so that's not something that you can ask for more generally you want to ensure that the two curves don't share a component otherwise of course you're going to have infinitely many points of intersection and you're going to have i mean that that answer is not super interesting so the way you get around this problem is by asking that there are no uh, common points of intersection oh, i mean sorry i meant to say that there are <coughs> no components there are no common components to both these curves which is the notion that you can make precise um about whether they share any component of degree one or two or whatever okay the next problem that we have is for example that if you've got y equals x squared plus one and y equals x i've plotted this here for your convenience you can see that these two curves actually don't intersect at all so of course the answer is zero not two so one way of approaching this is perhaps you can say perhaps we can put an upper bound on the number of points of intersection of curves but not an exact answer but in fact you can give an exact answer so let's see how we can solve this problem why do these curves don't intersect well the answer is when you plug in y equals x in this equation of y equals x squared plus one that's going to give you the quadratic equation x squared minus x plus one equals zero aha that's a problem because this quadratic does not have real roots well what kind of roots does this quadratic have well it does have complex roots though so the question you can ask is if the real numbers are <coughs> insufficient can we go to a bigger system of numbers to answer this question and the answer is yes of course the way you solve this problem of two curves not intersecting over the reals one of the ways you do that is you just say that well let's work over the complex numbers then if the complex numbers give me a solution to this guy and indeed you can think about these curves and you can think about the pairs of complex numbers a comma a uh, that gives you the line y equals x in the complex plane and then you can think about again numbers pairs x comma y satisfying y equals x squared plus one where x and y are now complex numbers and that gives you the quote unquote parabola it doesn't quite look like the parabola anymore but that's what we're going to go with as a name we go with so that's the idea so how do you solve this problem the technical word for this is that you pass to an algebraically closed field so what what that <coughs> means is that every polynomial in that field actually has a root in that field so unlike x squared minus x plus one if you're not familiar with the word field that's okay just think of them as r or c or something like that so for example if you take x squared minus x plus one equals zero that's a polynomial defined over the reals that does not have a real root so the reals are not algebraically closed but it's also a polynomial defined over the complex numbers and it does have complex roots so it's so well add this and a, a, fun, a, a theorem that's called the that's egregiously called the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that the complex numbers are in fact algebraically closed so the way you solve this problem is by looking at complex pairs of points instead of a real pairs of points okay that's one problem solved next problem well the next thing that you have to account for is something like multiplicity if you think about it for a second if you take the circle x squared plus y squared equal one and let's get back over r just for the sake of our intuition if you take the circle x squared plus y squared equal one and you take the line x equals one well now that line intersects that circle in just one point that the point one comma zero why well you can plug this x equals one here and that's going to give you y squared equals zero even over the complex numbers that's just got one solution <coughs> so what's the problem here well the problem is if you move the line a little bit to the left you would actually have two points of intersection what's happening is that at this exact precise point the two points of intersection they're actually coalescing into a single point which is a point of what we call tangency to the circle and this is not just a problem with lines you can also have two curves of higher degree be tangent to each other for example i've got the circle here and an ellipse drawn here and these guys are tangent to each other at the point minus one comma zero so tangency is a real problem uh, to counting the number of uh, solutions the way 
classical mathematicians, so mathematicians of the 16th and 17th centuries, thought about this problem, where they thought about shifting the line a little bit, moving the line a little bit, and uh, just tweaking the line a little bit and see how that changes the number of points. Of course, that was not super rigorous. The way we deal with this <coughs> problem today is by associating to each... Okay, I see that there's something in the Q&A, but I can't open that right now. I'm going to answer this at the end of the talk, if that's okay. So uh, the way we solve this problem today is by associating to each curves and each point of intersection something called the intersection multiplicity at that point. So that, for example, a circle and a line at a point of tangency have intersection multiplicity 2. And the circle and the ellipse, even though it's not super obvious, have intersection multiplicity 3, and so on. And you count by thinking of this point of intersection multiplicity 2 to be actually a point <coughs> that's counted twice. That's the idea. So the way you solve this problem is by counting points with their intersection multiplicities. But there's a, a fourth and even more subtle problem that happens when you take two parallel lines. Now you can't get away. You Even if you dealt with the complex numbers, these guys don't have a simultaneous solution. Okay, I have something. Uh, I have some questions and I can't see them. Okay, never mind. I'm going to answer them at the end of the talk, so please stick around. So you've got these two parallel lines and these guys don't have even a common complex solution. So how do you get around this problem? And this is a nasty one. But again, the way classical geometers of the 17th and 18th centuries got around this by saying was, oh, they got around this by saying that if you got two parallel lines, you can just tweak one of them a little bit move it a little bit and that's now going to get the lines are no longer parallel and now you're going to get exactly one point of intersection but that's not really rigorous it's not what does it mean to tweak a curve i mean it's just, it's easy to see what it means perhaps to tweak a line but what does it mean to tweak a cubic i don't know how to tweak a cubic so the real and the way we get around this problem today is by talking about <coughs> something called the projective plane and those of you who do some Olympiad maths, you might be familiar with this concept. The way you deal with the projective plane is that you add points, things that are called points at infinity or perspective points at infinity. And this was a hard concept to grasp. I mean, it's it's not easy what a good definition of uh, points at infinity is and what a good definition would uh, make this rigorous. But Things about perspectivity and go, observations about perspectivity go far, as far back as Pappus, as to Pappus of Alexandria. A real first treatise was written by Bruno Shelley. Uh, the, it's called The Geometry of Perspective, written in 1425. And a lot of work on perspectivity was done by Kepler and Dessars and Poncelet, who really laid the foundation of projective geometry. So you've got systematic studies by these guys. But the first time somebody introduced coordinates to deal with these guys was this little guy here, August Ferdinand Möbius. He, <coughs> early 19th century math German mathematician, uh, famous for introducing a bunch of things named after him. So the Möbius strip, the Möbius inversion formula, uh, the Möbius transformations of the upper half plane, and so on. So Möbius, in his 1827 treatise, uh, Der Bärisch Calcul. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He defined homogeneous coordinates of the projective plane by thinking about triples of numbers, A0, A1, A2, where you separate them by colons and think about these as given as numbers modular scalars. Okay, the, the point is that this, this is all the problems you had. Once you solve all of these problems, then you do in fact get a real theorem. So, and this is now called Bezu's theorem, named after this French guy here, Etienne Bezu. And it says that, uh, okay. <coughs> it says that if F and G are projective plane curves over the complex numbers that don't share a common component, then the sum then first of all there are only finitely many points of intersection of these curves and secondly when you sum over those points of intersection with intersection multiplicity so the ip here stands for intersection multiplicity then you do in fact get the product of the degrees and this is a really nice theorem it's a really non-trivial theorem it's one of those first great theorems of classical algebraic geometry 
And if you're interested, uh, the, the hardest part of the proof of this theorem is getting a correct definition of intersection multiplicity in place for general curves. That's the hardest part of this theorem. The rest of it follows really easily. You can find a proof, for example, in William Fulton's algebraic curves or in uh, an appendix to Silverman and Tate's uh, rational points and algebraic curves, both of which are written for undergraduates. So it should be reasonably uh, accessible. So that's Bezu's theorem. Now I want to use Bezu's theorem. I want to spend the next five-ish minutes talking about how Bezu's theorem implies a really classical theorem of uh, of geometry, which is known as Pascal's theorem or Pascal's hexagrammer mysticum. He discovered this theorem. Pascal discovered this theorem when he was just sixteen. Blaise Pascal, this guy here, a French mathematician, early seventeenth century again, discovered this theorem just when he was sixteen in his essay Pour le Conique. And <coughs> it's the theorem that says that if you take three intersections of opposite pairs of sides of a hexagon inscribed in a conic, that's where the name hexagram or mysticum comes from. Uh, these three points of intersection lie on a straight line, as you can probably see in the figure here. And an immediate corollary of this theorem I want to point out is Pappus's theorem. Since, as we observed a, a few moments ago, a pair of straight lines is also a conic, right? So... Um, and you will see, as I'll show you in the proof of this theorem in, next, in the next few minutes, that the only property of a conic that we're using here is that conics are plane curves of degree two. That's really the only property we're using. So before I give you the proof, I want to give you a big picture idea of how the proof goes. Basic, the basic idea behind the proof is that you contradict Bezu's theorem by having a cubic intersect with the given conic in seven points. Well, how's that possible? How can you contradict a theorem? The way you contradict the theorem is, of course, by contradicting the hypotheses of the theorem. So let's see how the proof goes. You start with c of x, y being the equation of the conic. So something like x squared plus y squared minus 5. And you let a1, b1, a2, b2, and a3, b3 denote the equations of the sides of the inscribed hexagon in that order. So just as you can see in the figure here, you would name them alternately with a1, b1, and so on. And, and these are the equations. So for example, a1 is the expression x plus 2y minus 5. So that when you set it to 0, you get that side of the um, hexagon. Is that clear? Let's go on. So that's uh, c is a conic. So it's, a <coughs> it's quadratic in x and y. And the AIs are lin AIs and BIs are linear. Now you define a one parameter family of cubic curves, f sub lambda of x comma y, to be a product of these lines, so a1, a2, a3, plus a scalar lambda, which we'll determine later, times a product b1, b2, b3. Now the thing is, for each lambda, this passes through the nine points of intersection of AI with BJ. Right? In general, AI and BJ, they're going to intersect in exactly one point. Once we have the projective plane, any two lines intersect in exactly one point, any two distinct lines. So these are going to give you nine points of intersection. But at any one of these points of intersection, either AI is going to be zero or BI is going to be zero for some, or BJ is going to be zero for some I, or I and J, which means <coughs> that F passes through that point, right? To pass through a point means exactly for the, the, the curve, the equation to vanish. Okay, now this passes through the nine points of intersection of AI with BJ, of which exactly six lie on this conic, <clears throat> if you think about it. And the other three are these lines that you want to prove uh, lie on a straight line. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason this is exactly six is because a conic is determined by five points. Think about why that implies that this is exactly six. Uh, the next thing that you do is now you can tweak this lambda. So now you've got this one parameter family. You can vary the lambda. And in varying the lambda, you can pick a value, lambda naught, say, so that f sub lambda naught now passes through a seventh point on the conic. Well, that contradicts Bezu's theorem, unless it contradicts the hypotheses of Bezu's theorem, which asks that these two curves don't share a common component. So then if f sub lambda is a cubic, and it intersects a conic in seven points, which is more than the product of the degrees, three times two, which is six, then they must share a common component. So the next thing you do is that you, it follows from an argument that I don't have the time here, but it follows to describe. It follows that you can write F sub lambda naught as a product of C and something else. 
Now C is a cube. Uh, C is a conic, so it's a quadratic. F is a cubic, so it's got degree three. So well, the quotient then must be of degree one. In other words, it's a line. And then since F sub lambda not passes through all nine points, and the conic does not pass through the other three points, <coughs> they must be on the line L. This I think is the correct proof of Pascal's theorem because it makes no exception about the edge cases. Uh, like uh, you don't have to give a limiting argument as geometers in the 18th century did to cover a pair of straight lines, which gives us Pappus's theorem. The way they did the was by thinking of a pair of straight lines as a limit of uh, hyperbole and then asserting that Pascal's theorem holds in the limit. It's a, it's a complicated argument, but it works. But this I think is cleaner because all you're assuming about C is that it's a quadratic curve and that's really the property that's being used. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit, give you a brief idea about classical algebra, algebraic geometry. And so I, the, all of this was classical algebraic geometry, straight up in the realm of classical algebraic geometry. But there's so much more to it than what I just described. There's so much more to it than Bezos' theorem. Algebraic geometers, uh, in general, are interested in analogs of what we just talked about. They're interested in analogs of plane curves in higher dimensions. So for that, they define and work with affine n space, which is just n tuples a n r, uh, and r here <coughs> means real numbers. So it's just n tuples of real numbers. This is basically the same thing as the vector space r n, except you don't have a distinguished origin. So that's what affine n space is. You can think of affine two, affine one space as the line, affine two space as the plane, affine three space as a 3D space, and so on. Uh, so this is a geometry, uh, it's, a, it's a generalization to higher dimensions. And then again, you can also generalize the projective plane to higher dimensions. You've got uh, what's called what's called PNC. Uh, or you can also have it PNR. It's just, again, as before, it's n plus one tuples of elements of C, and they're, they're not all zero. And then you define varieties, which are basically zero sets of polynomials in, in these spaces. So here I have an example of a variety. <coughs> is the intersection of the cylinder with a sphere. And the other example I have here is the Steiner surface, which is a pretty fascinating object. So if you just, if you want to Google and look that up, that would be nice. The first, the, the keystone of classical algebraic geometry is the th theorem, which is called Hilbert's null Stell and Satz. So null means zero, Stell means to stay, and Satz, Satz is a statement or theorem. So it's Hilbert's theorem on the location of zeros. And what it says is actually much more precise than what I can describe here. But it basically says that this idea of looking at algebra through the lens of geometry and geometry through the lens of algebra is not unfounded. That there's this one-to-one -one cor correspondence between algebra and geometry. So this is the right way to think about these objects. So that's all about classical geometry. Let me give you a brief idea about modern algebraic geometry. Uh, modern algebraic geometry uses what are called schemes, which I don't have the the resources to define at the moment just don't have the resources but they were introduced <coughs> basically by these two guys here alexander grothendieck and jean pierre serre both of them french mathematicians of the highest caliber uh, and modern algebraic geometry has applications to a variety of fields so it's got applications to theoretical physics string theory it's got application to applied physics robotics and 3d modeling it's got applications to cryptography and what's called algebraic coding theory it's got applications to other fields of pure math, like arithmetic geometry. One of the things uh, that you prove, for example, in arithmetic geometry, well, you don't prove it, I don't prove it, Andrew Wiles did, was Fermat's last theorem. That fits rather squarely in arithmetic geometry. And, and much more. It's got so much more to it. And I'm going to end here with a quote by David Mumford, another giant of this field. And I'm going to read it. Algebraic geometry seems to have an ha seems to have acquired the reputation of being esoteric, exclusive, and very abstract, with adherents who are secretly plotting to take over all the rest of mathematics. And in one respect, this last point is accurate. Okay, that's all I had to say. Uh, thank you for the talk. And here's my email address if you want to reach out to me and let me know if you like the presentation or if you want to discuss anything about math. Okay, that's all I have to say. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes trying to answer questions. Okay, so I see a few questions. Okay, so one of them is, 
is what we discussed is what we discussed Bezu's theorem is that the Kelly Bakarak theorem. And no, unfortunately, that's not quite what the statement of the Kelly Bakarak theorem says. Uh, you can look up Kelly Bakarak theorem uh, online. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't have the time in this talk to include that. So that's the reason it's not here. But I did manage to give a proof of Pascal's theorem using um, using Bezu's theorem, which is much more fundamental in my opinion. Okay. Uh, next question, why can't we work in projective or vector spaces instead of working in affine spaces? Okay, so that's a good question. And the answer to that is that we do indeed choose to work with projective spaces instead of affine spaces. And a vector space is basically the same thing as affine space. So you're not saying anything new here. But the point is that it's just that a projective space is locally what it's called. is It's locally affine, which means that if you take any a uh, pointed projective space is going to near it, it's going to look like affine space. So it's really important to develop this theory of affine spaces too. Okay, and you meant uh, Kelly Bakarak theorem for the hexagon, uh, hexagram of mysticum. Yeah, uh, you can look that proof up. It's a really nice proof. And Kelly Bakarak theorem has applications to other fields. It's got applications to elliptic curves and uh, proving basically that they, so the group law on uh, ellipticals is associative and so on. So it's a fantastic theorem and I should encourage you to look it up, even though I'm sorry, I could unfortunately not include it in this talk. Okay, the next question I have is, <coughs> can you briefly describe a conic? A good question. So a conic, as the Greeks defined it, was uh, basically a section of a double cone. So you take a double, in, a double cone, uh, which is just two cones joined at the vertex and basically to conjoin at the vertex in a compatible way and you take a section of that so by a section i mean you just intersect it with a plane in three space for instance and that is what the greeks defined as conics the way we understand conics today is that we think of conics as quadratic curves in the plane and there's this huge huge theory of uh, conic sections and uh, how quadratic curves behave and how any two quadratic curves are projectively equivalent, at least over the complex numbers and so on. Okay, so that's the, uh, um, unfortunately, I don't have the time to talk about this in more detail. You can probably just send me an email if you're interested, or you can look it up online and try to find resources about how you define a conic more precisely. Okay, next question is, <coughs> can you please tell us something about the brachis to Crohn curve? Uh, brachis, the brachis to Crohn curve is a fantastic curve. It's a, it solves what is called the minimal time problem. I don't unfortunately have the time to talk about it right now, but luckily in this case, three blue, one brown has a fantastic video that talks about the Brachis to Crohn. And I would encourage you to check that out. Okay. Those are all the questions I see. I think that should be it then. Yep. Samir? Yep. Uh, thank you so much. Um, okay. So thank you so much to Garo for a wonderful class and thank you all for attending. Um, you can feel free to join your next class now uh, at the link that can be found in the catalog that was sent out. Um, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>